from Seagate Wines and welcome to part two of our series on Bordeaux. Um, today we are going to talk about the left bank. And the left bank refers to the, uh, the left side of the rivers. Um, the rivers being the Gironde, which runs from the Atlantic Ocean to the city of Bordeaux, uh, just before the city of Bordeaux. And then it splits into two other rivers, the Dordogne, which is on the north side, and uh, the Garonne, which runs south um, on the south side. And in between the two rivers as it splits is an area called Entre de Mer, and we will get to that later on. But everything to the left of that, or the south side of the river, is what is considered the left bank. And the left bank is primarily made up of two regions, and that is Grave, which is near the city of Bordeaux to the south, and Medoc, which is to the city from the city of Bordeaux to the north. Okay, um, so really driving along that highway, which is the D2 that runs from the city of Bordeaux all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, um, driving along that road, which is known as the Route de Vin, is basically kind of like driving through a three dimensional wine list. All right, for anyone who has more than a passing interest in wine, driving through these little towns is, is kind of like a movie buff doing Hollywood tours. Um, but it's also, you know, it can also be a little bit disappointing um, simply because these little tiny towns and, and the landscape is rather plain. It doesn't provide a whole lot of drama for all of these great chateaus that you've heard so much about your whole life. Um, but, you know, also like it's wine, this region really requires patience and a readiness to look beyond the obvious. All right, this triangle piece of land, and we'll put up a map so you can see it. The triangle piece of land here um, gets his name from an ancient group of Celtic kings called the Medjulai. Uh, the ancient Celtic tribe that lived in this area uh, more than 2,000 years previously. But for most of its history, it was basically just known as the northern part of Grave. Until the 17th century, there was really little reason to mention it at all. Um, as a, It was kind of a miserable place. Uh, just forests and swamp lands with about 50,000 hectares of shifting sand dunes and water. Um, and it was always changing based on winter rain versus summer evaporation. And, you know, it, it even encroached into the city uh, of Bordeaux at one point in the 1700s. Um, the inhabitants here kind of mostly scratched out a feudal existence um, in small little hamlets protected by um, man-made ditches that they... Uh, that were built in order to re relieve some of the water and there's from the Gironde itself um, which they use for all of their transport. Um, little tiny outcroppings of land um, did allow for some chateaus in that area to be built as far back as the 10th century. Um, but at that time grapes would have probably been just a, a fairly small portion of the different crops and stuff that they would have been growing. Um, the river being the only mode of transport um, was not also without its perils. Uh, pirates forced the building of the fortress at the, um, at the northern end of the Medoc that uh, basically would become Chateau Le Tour later on in the 14th century. But until 1770, the Gironde was essentially uncharted. Navigation was done basically by depth soundings and by the occasional landmark on either side of the river. Um, the villages and the towns were built in places where boats could safely get to shore because it was deep enough to unload and unload their goods. Um, the main wine areas of saint Estef, Poyac, Saint-Julien, and Margot were simply just ports where the boats could get in and things could get loaded on. So the names did not necessarily come from, from wine. They were, the wine came from the names. And that was basically because that's where the boat could get to the shore. Um, chateaus were built within a proximity to the port where they could easily get their goods in and get their wines out. And then the wines from each port took on the names of that port. Uh, one of the lesser known ports on that same spot in the river is called Lamarck. And near that port, Chateau Lamarck, home to 21 generations of the Marquise d'Evry family, were built in 1076 and this is the Chateau de Marc here and on the front you can see um, a picture of the Chateau and I'll show you some pictures of that Chateau and the Marquis de Avry himself as we spent a day with him there not too long ago. 
Um, it's a really cool place. Uh, very ancient medieval castle built in 1076. And um, it's still incredibly uh, well looked after. It's in great shape still to this day. Um, other early chateaus in that area at the time included Chateau Beaumont in the 10th century and Chateau de Seine, who produced the wine for the wedding of Henry II to Eleanor of Aquitaine in 1158. Um, this started the occupation of Bordeaux by the English. And it's also said that Chateau de Seine also provided wine to, the, to English forces as they retreated back to England 302 years later at the end of the English occupation. Chateau de Seine is still one of our favorite wines to this day. Um, over the 11th century, uh, or over the 17th century, sorry, things started to change a lot in the Medoc, as the arrival of Dutch engineers who were known as desiccateurs or dryers in English. Um, they were hired by an Englishman named Humphrey Bradley, and Bradley had been given large land concessions by Henry IV, um, but the only problem was that he had to create the land by making, uh, by, by drying it out, getting rid of all the water and all of the swamp land. Um, so uh, they basically did this through a system of jalets, as J A L L E S, um, and the jalet is basically just a drainage ditch, and they're all still being used today, uh, more than four hundred years later. The Medoc basically became completely transformed during this time, as as thousands and thousands of hectares of land became available to use. Um, over this time, dozens of new chateaus were built um, on the newly reclaimed land. And amongst these were, were you know, very famous places like Chateau Margaux, which was built in 1570 by Pierre de Lestone, and Chateau Latour, um, uh, you know, Lafitte, Latour, these, these are the most famous names in wine. Um, and they all just started to pop up during the, the late 1500s, early 1600s, and into the 1700s. Chateau Latour's new neighbor would be Mr. Leoville, and if you know anything about Bordeaux, then you know that name. Um, then from there, the de Raison family, former managers of Chateau Latour, would build chateaus for each of their two sons and their one daughter and her husband, Mr. Pichon. So that's where you get all these famous names, uh, names like Raison Segla, uh, Raison Gassiz, Pichon Longueville. Um, all of these are basically coming from this one family um, and obviously the Leovilles as well who were currently running um, Chateau Latour and then from there became Leoville Lacasse just down the street and Leoville, Leoville Portfrere as well I and mean, it's just the names just go outwards from the first chateaus they just go outwards and it was all basically the same two families that started most of them. Um, next of the founding fathers was uh, Nicholas Alexandre, the Marquis de Ségur. His grandmother's dowry was bought Chateau Lafitte. His uh, Latour came from his mother's family, and his own marriage gained him Calon Ségur. He was nicknamed the Prince of Vines by Louis XV, and he died in 1755 as one of the wealthiest men in France. Three decades later, his grandson lost all of it to his creditors, and he had to end up fleeing the country. In 1786, Lafitte passed to a leading politician by the name of Pichard, who only ran it for six years before he became um, really the only major casualty in Bordeaux of the French Red Revolution when they sent him to the guillotine and chopped his head off. Um, other, other different um, chateaus were sequestered by the state, so they basically, the land was, was cut and then broken into smaller pieces. Um, and some of those include Chateau Margaux. Um, in these times, wines were traded by merchants and negotiants, kind of like they are today, uh, but they were traded as futures, kind of like pork belly or coffee. Um, most of them were still on the vine when they were purchased. Uh, to stabilize the prices of the futures, a list was created of all the best chateaus and the quality that they provided. This list was divided into five different levels, and only four chateaus were deemed at the highest level on the, at this time in 1855. That was Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Latour, Chateau Margaux, 
and in Grave Chateau Aubryon, which was, we've talked about before, the first branded wine in the world. In 1973, through what they consider to be a clerical, clerical error, uh, Chateau Mouton Rothschild was added to the list, making five premier crews. Uh, after the 1855 classification, Bordeaux had a really rough time. Uh, Phylloxera, which we've talked about before, in other videos, uh, uh, the, the wood louse that basically got into the rootstock and killed all of the vines across Europe. Um, Phylloxera devastated Bordeaux, and then after all the replanting, then you had World War I, which happened on a lot of this property. The Great Depression followed that, then World War II, where the Germans basically ransacked all of the great, all of the great chateaus and stole most of the, the back vintages of these wine houses. Um, going back into history and none of those wines exist still today, pretty much. I mean, there are a few collector items here and there, but most of them tend to be forgeries as uh, a lot of those wines were drank during the war or shortly thereafter, or they were just simply destroyed um, by the war itself. Um, the only thing that started to get Bordeaux back on its feet was three kind of back-to-back -back superlative vintages, 1945, 1947 and 1949's vintages saved Bordeaux as these three legendary vintages pretty much back to back helped bring badly needed capital back into the region to help rebuild after the war. Today, due to heavy death taxes and inheritance uh, land transfers and law uh, inheritance laws, there are very few Grand Chateaus that are still family owned. Most of them purchased by companies. Um, or businesses, uh, especially insurance companies. And however sad it is to see the loss of the family stories and these families' histories to each of these chateaus, these transactions usually mean a really quick improvement in the chateau as capital pours in and investments in improvement mean big returns and higher prices on the back end for the new buyers. Uh, Margot is the southernmost appellation in the Medoc with... Uh, more than 80 estates producing about seven and a half million bottles. So coming from the north going south, we pass through St. Estef, um, which is, this is from St. Estef. And then you go from St. Estef into Julien, St. Julien, and then from St. Julien into Pouillac. Um, so it should be Pouillac. And then from Pouillac into Margot um, here. And it's the farthest south, so you end up having the ripest grapes. Um, it's obviously, you know, a little bit slight touch warmer weather. Uh, the soil is a little bit different as well. Um, produce, it produces about seven and a half million bottles a year in Margot, and there are 21 classified growths. Uh, people say Margot vines are a little bit more delicate, but I think that that's only because of the people who make them. Um, you could easily make an overripe, very concentrated, really intense bottle of Margot, but that tends to not be the style that they produce there just because that's a, that's what the people who are making them want. Um, they, the Margot wines, um, sometimes it can be a fault that they go out of their way to make them uh, a little too delicate and then they lose all of their character. Um, so finding good Margot is, is a, you do have to search for it. You do have to, you do have to actually take some time and to look for it. Um, Margot is a region because of its, its very clay based soil. Um, and, and it's kind of a clay gravel soil, which is a little different than some of the other places that are more gravelly. Um, Margot, it's an area that really needs a very particularly deft hand to make wines that don't seem clumsy. Um, okay, so the fame of St. Estef, Pouillac, St. Julien, Margot, Listrac, and Moulis, these are the main regions of the Médoc, uh, make it easy to forget Haute Médoc. And Haute Médoc is considered Upper Médoc. It's uh, farther away from the ocean, so moving upwards along the road. Um, famous names here are like uh, Belgrave, uh, La Tour Carnet, Chateau de Marc, which we've discussed earlier, and my favorite, uh, Sociando Malay, one of the great values of Bordeaux. Um, these, these wines are uh, all unclassified chateaus, making some of the greatest value wines in the region. Now, 
they do have the ability to be called like for example La Marque um, is considered a Grand Cru it's not a Grand Cru Class A it is a Grand Cru okay there is a difference and then they and they do mark them out that way um, but definitely that area Haute Medoc you'll find some incredibly good value wines uh, most of the wine regions of Bordeaux um, we're now going to move south here and we're going to talk about, about Grave and Passac de Lignon. Um, the wine regions of Bordeaux are named for people, people who've done great things or, or people of renown. Um, the Medjolai, for example, Celtic Kings. Saint Emilion on the right bank, um, you know, the saint of the right bank blinds, um, who hand dug himself a cave out of limestone and, and dedicated his life to that area. Um, but Grave is different. Grave takes its name directly from the soil that provides the wines with their character. The gravel, or Grave in French, references all of the little white stones that make up much of the soil, um, especially on the best plots. Um, plays, you know, different um, areas here, you would definitely know simply because of uh, you know their history and, and how famous they are and the biggest one being Chateau Aubryon. Uh, it was the first branded wine in the world, the first wine sold in its bottle with a name with a label. Um, Grave was once the most famous wine region in the world for wine and it still is the only region in Bordeaux that is equally famous for its white wines as it is for its red wines. Nowadays big names like Chateau Aubryon uh, and Chateau Cap Clément are, are known just as much um, for white wines as they are for red wines. Uh, these wines tend to be big names that you're gonna find in the collections of big collectors or on big restaurant wine lists. But um, Grave also tends to have uh, a lot of lesser known wines, a lot of uh, simpler wines, good quality, great value, because they just get overshadowed by all of the different wines of the Medoc that just hold so much clout. All right, so let's talk about, um, you know, we think it's really interesting that now over the course of history, the most famous of all of the wine regions being Grave has become the least desirable of all of the wine regions of Bordeaux. Um, obviously, you get this enormous backlog of huge names in the Medoc. You know, wines coming from Pouillac, from, um, from Saint-Julien, from Saint-Estephe, from, Saint, uh, from, from Margot. These wines are very, very well known around the world. And now, the modern style of wine on the right bank has really taken off. Wines from Saint-Emilion, um, obviously going back into early 19th or uh, early 20th century wines like Cheval Blanc um, and then into Pomerol wines like Petrus or uh, Chateau Sartin or the now you know the very famous uh, Le Pen. These wines represent you know these big hedonistic wines and then it's kind of left Grave in the background. Okay Grave. Grapes have been grown here on this plot of land uh, since the third century. In 1307, the Archbishop of Bordeaux was a surprise choice to become the Supreme Pontiff. Bertrand de Goth then became known as Pope Clement V. In the town of Passac, very close to the city of Bordeaux, he is commemorated there by Chateau Pape Clément. Where is Chateau Pape Clément? Here it is here. Chateau Pape Clément. Um... That's where he planted his first vines himself there in, the 13, in, in 1300. And then at the southern end of the Rhone Valley in the southern part of France, he set up an exiled papal, pap papacy um, at the end of his reign in Avignon and started vineyards that are now known as Chateau Neuf de Pape. Uh, Clement had a huge influence on wine in this region, leading others to build in the area of Passac and in Lyon. Uh, he, it had an elevated land area and an ancient Roman spring as a source of good water. Clement also forbade 
innkeepers from blending wines that came from Grave with wines that came from the Medoc in order to give Grave wines an elevated status. There was also a ban on the promotion of wines in this region if they were from outside of Grave. So you couldn't come into Grave and, and have someone being, someone couldn't promote wines from the Medoc inside of this region. They were trying to keep it as local as possible. Um, however, the wines of Pape Clement, although large in reputation and in price, uh, were only allowed to be drank by the clergy for more than 200 years until the success of Chateau Aubriand in England. And then Aubriand, basically the, the clergy started to understand how much money could be made by selling the wine instead of drinking it all themselves. And that meant more wine for the church. So then they finally started selling the wine in the 1600s. Um, Aubryon today almost looks odd um, because it's been there since the late 1500s. And it, it, now it's completely surrounded by little office buildings and undistinguished kind of little houses. And, uh, and it basically borders on all of these little spots um, right up against the highway. Um, so it, it stands out a little bit. It's a little bit strange now in its current setting. Um, you know, def defining the style of Grave wine is very difficult because the reds seem to mix the black currant and cigar box that you get from the Medoc with some of the richness of Pomerol and the earthiness of saint Emilion. So blind tasting them can be really, really tricky unless you know a specific wine itself. Styles from house to house in Grave vary much more than in the other regions. But the white wine of Grave are undoubtedly some of the greatest white wines in the world. Uh, the flavors depend pretty much on the percentage of Sauvignon Blanc, anywhere from 25 to 100 percent. Um, and the richer peach peach uh, flavor of Semillon. And then also how much new oak is used in their production also has a big influence on their flavors. Um, in 1987, the region of Passac Lignon was created uh, to further show the best quality Grave wines. Um, that were coming from the north. Uh, all of the northern part of Grave tends to produce better wine than the southern part of Grave. Um, so the northernmost part of Grave is the area that is the closest to the city of Bordeaux, containing 16 Grand Cru Classé chateaus. So moving away from what we um, normally talk about with this, there is one more very important region on the left bank, and that is Sautern. Now, I know a lot of people have heard of Sautern, but they don't necessarily know what Sautern is. Sautern is actually, um, it is actually an area starting with the town of Sautern, and it contains five more small little towns in this region. Of all of the luxuries of the world, the luscious gold of fine Sautern is one of the most extraordinary. Uh, it's... Production relies completely on the unpredictable development of an ugly mold on the surface of the grapes. And then the patience and the care of producers who turn these rotten grapes into wine. Um, it is very, very difficult these days to enter this area of Bordeaux by accident. Um, there are far too many signs advertising appellations and chateaus. Historically, the five villages that make up Sauternes were simply a higher quality part of the southern area of Grave. Prignac, closest to the river, has had wine production here since the 8th century. By the 18th century, Sauternes was already known for their sweetness. For the wines to have an intensity of flavor, this sweetness and the complex mixture of honey, dried apricot and peaches that we expect the grapes have to be affected by a benign fungus called Botrytis cinerea. It produces what is known as the noble rot. It is a dark, fuzzy mold which uh, only appears in very few regions in the world, making the fruit look so unappealing that only courage and desperation would have driven people to use them. In fact, there is a story about Robert Mondavi in California doing uh, a similar production because of the, the mold that was growing on the grapes. And he wanted to mimic Sauternes with his wines in Napa Valley. 
but they only did it in the dead of night because they were afraid that somebody would say something to the Food and Drug Administration and that he would be shut down because he was producing wine with moldy grapes. Um, the first people to use this method um, were the Hungarians who were making Tokai or Royal Tokai uh, wines in Hungary in the 17th century. In 1847, the Marquis Bertrand de, de, de Las Roses, he was the owner of Chateau Iquem, and his family owned that property um, basically since the early 16th century. He spent a little bit longer than he had planned on a sales trip to Russia, and by the time he got back, the fungus had taken over the vineyard. Uh, a dozen years later, the wine that was made from those moldy grapes would be sold to the Tsar of Russia's brother for the unheard of price of 20,000 gold francs per barrel or 16 francs per bottle, which is more than four times the price of any previous vintage ever produced. This also might explain how in the 1855 classification, Chateau de Saint, or Chateau de Chem, sorry, was given a class all to itself above all other Grand Cru class wines. So nowadays, still to this day, Chateau Yquem is known as a premier Grand Cru Class A wine, whereas all of the other wines in the top level, the, those five great wines, are simply known as uh, premier Cru Class A. They're not a premier Grand Cru Class A, okay? There's just the, just the little differences there. Um, today, while um, most Chateau across Bordeaux compete on a fairly level playing field. Uh, Chateau Yquem still stands head and shoulders above all of its neighbors. Its yields are very low, one eighth of, a, of what a Chateau in Medoc would get. Um, less than one glass of wine is produced per vine. And the harvest is incredibly slow and very labor intensive, taking as long as two months with more than 12 or 13 different pickings to get only the best grapes at their best time with the optimum amount of rot. When a vintage fails to meet Chateau Yquem standard, they just simply do not produce wine. If any Chateau in Sauterne or Barzac choose to make a dry wine, and there are lots of white, dry whites, those whites will only be known as a generic Bordeaux Blanc. Okay, so they do not give, um, the Sauterne region does not give its Grand Cru or Premier Cru houses the ability to call their dry white wines Grand Cru or Premier Cru. So that's, that's as we're going, you know, southwards down that left bank of the river. Now I want to take a quick second and just quickly discuss uh, Entre de Mer, okay? Entre de Mer is a piece of land that I spoke about earlier in this that it takes up the, the, the space between the two rivers, the uh, Dordogne on the top and the Garonne on the south. And this area of land uh, basically has been kind of overlooked and it's, nobody really talks about it. They produce primarily only white wine, although they do produce red and rosé, but the red and the rosé wines produced in this region cannot be called entre de mer, they would simply be called Bordeaux. Um, not even a bourgeois cru or, uh, you know, it's just Bordeaux red or Bordeaux rosé. Um, you need to be a white wine in order to, in order to have the AOC designation of Entre de Mer. It's usually overlooked. Entre de Mer is a white wine um, area uh, kind of secret for the Bordelais, and they try to keep it to themselves. This lovely, crisp, dry white wines made from Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon are some of the best value wines around. Uh, Entre de Mer basically translates into between two seas, as we've spoken about, is that between those two rivers, the Dordogne and the Garonne. Most people who come through the region are simply passing through, usually headed from the city of Bordeaux to the right bank vineyards uh, of Saint-Emilion, Palmerol and Fronsac, which are on the other side of the, the rivers. Um, the one chateau that we do want to mention from Entre de Mer is Chateau Bonnet, okay? Chateau Bonnet makes some of the best white wines on the planet, and their, the family that owns it has become one of the world's most famous wine families. So the Chateau Bonnet is owned 
by um, a gentleman named Andre Lerton, and I'm sure that you've probably heard of him. Even here in the Bahamas, we do get Lerton and Sons wines everywhere. They're generic Bordeaux wines that have been made incredibly popular, but they do have a few houses in different areas that make extraordinary wines, and Chateau Bonnet in Entre de Mer is one of them. Okay, just so you get the idea there that this area does produce some really cool wines, and it's something worth looking into because sometimes you can buy these wines for very, 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 very cheap. Can be one of those everyday uh, drinking wines for you that's under $15 retail, okay? So that's the left bank. I hope you got something out of this. Um, keep tuning in, I'm gonna go, we're gonna come right back and we'll get into the right bank vineyards of, of St. Emilion and Pomerol. So um, thanks for tuning in for video number two of the Bordeaux series. And we'll see you again real soon. Cheers.